but our subject is the Christian thinking or the Christian attitude. And this is a remarkable passage before us in the first half or third of Philippians chapter two. There is a powerful exhortation in the passage, in the verses. Well, you can see it beginning there in verse two. Be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This tremendous exhortation to humility, an outgoing concern for others and not for ourselves. But it is, if I may put it this way, sandwiched. The exhortations lie between our attention being directed to the blessings we have in Christ, to stir our gratitude as if the apostle writing under inspiration considers that we cannot respond adequately to the exhortation to humility without being stirred, urged, stimulated by a fresh realization of our indebtedness to Christ and all that he's given us and all that he does for us. That will stir us, he seems to say. That will affect us. So he begins with that, and then immediately after the exhortation, he further buttresses his words by showing and pointing to the great humility of Christ, our Lord and Saviour. So it is effectively a sandwich. But we begin with this first verse, and uh, the famous verse of the four ifs, and they're very significant ifs. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies. So let's consider in a very simple expository manner these verses in the time we have available. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. Of course there is. There's so much consolation in Christ, consoling by him and comfort. This is the word that literally means if there be any calling near of the Savior. That's the picture. Christ calls near calls us to himself, sometimes for admonition, sometimes for counsel, sometimes for comfort and encouragement. And it's the latter which is principally in mind here. So our translators have translated the calling near term as consolation. If there be any consolation or consoling in Christ, of course there is. Just look at that first chapter once again and verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. And then the last part of the verse, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And those words breathe opposition and difficulty. You have to stand firmly because there are pressures to sweep you away and you have to work hard for the Lord with one mind cooperating together to serve him, the working church concept. Yes, but to do that you need encouragement and consolation because there are great forces against you. And chapter 1 verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries which is to them an evident token of perdition, and so on. There's intimidation, and intimidation that would terrify people from various adversaries, from false teachers, from Judaizers, most of all from the Jews, and of course from the Gentiles of Philippi, from the trade guilds, because by being a Christian, you couldn't go to the idolatrous feasts, and so therefore you would be fired, and all kinds of hostility would be given to you. 
they would be terrified often by these things. And then verse 29, but unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer. There was most vicious persecution. Philippi was a proud place. It was, as an individual city, it was nevertheless designated the honor of being a Roman colony. And the citizens of Philippi were very proud of being Romans and following the Roman polytheistic religion and the worshiping of many gods. And they were infuriated that within the walls of their city, there were Christian people who preached one God and Christ. And so there was terrible intimidation and persecution on that account. And so we come to chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be therefore any consoling in Christ, of course they knew consolation. But let's think of the if. Do we? If there be. Before we get on to the great exhortation to humility, if there be any consoling. You're a Christian, dear friend. You love the Lord. You've repented of your sin. You've trusted in the shed blood of Christ. You feel sure you've known conversion, the new birth. But have you lost touch with consolation that comes from Christ in all circumstances, in all difficulties? Do you pray to him and prove him? Or do you become upended and upset and disturbed and faithless? Are we daily experiencing these things? This is only the first of them. Consolation, strength in answer to prayer. Blessing and help that proves the presence of God. Uh, blessing on our ministry of intercession. And we've seen conversions. And light and understanding on our problems. And in the word of God. And communion with Christ and a sense of destiny and of heaven. And these things put everything in perspective and lift us up. Is that our experience, week by week, that we're walking with the Lord? If there be, for you, even as a Christian, if there be strong consoling and encouragement and answered prayer from the Lord, well, let us hope so, friends. If you've lost touch with this, well, come back to him straight away. You may not think of yourself as a backslider, but we are, in a sense, if we're not experiencing his presence and his power and his goodness, it's because we've left off prayer. It's because we've left off praise and worship in a true spirit. But then there's the second if, if there be any consolation, if any comfort of love. Are you aware of his love? Do you reflect often on Calvary and his love for his people so that it moves you? Are you aware of his provision and thank him for everything? Is your comfort, uh, sense of his love, your assurance amplified by daily praise of him, praise and thanksgiving? If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, you haven't broken fellowship of the Spirit, I hope. When the Spirit touches the conscience and our conscience moves us and we're warned of some sin that we have committed or are about to commit, do we respond to the voice of conscience? Remember, it's the Spirit who moves it in the life of the Christian. And do we repent and seek the help of God to mortify that sin to put it away, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any illuminations, because you're studying the Word and you're in prayer and therefore the sense of the Word is brought into your heart and into your mind, not a revelation of something you didn't know just for you, but oh, you see things with a force and a vigor and a wonder that you didn't see before because the Spirit illuminates you even as you read. Do you know the fellowship, the partnership of the Spirit? So your private reading comes to life and moves your heart and challenges and helps you. If any bowels and mercies, oh, dear friends, you're aware 
of the great sympathy and patience of Christ with you and that he deigns to hear even your intercessory prayers and you're humbled before him. Is this your experience of a Christian walk? Of course it is if you're following hard after the Lord. And when you think of these things and the privileges of this river of evidence that flows through our lives, that Christ is with us and that we are his, well then, the apostle says in verse 2, fulfill ye my joy, that this so moves you that you live humble Christian lives. That's the exhortation we're coming to. So we reflect, and we should be able to say, yes, I know the partnership of the Spirit. I know the love of Christ. I know answered prayer. I know strength and comfort. I commit everything to him. And whenever Satan tempts me to grumble or complain or to blame other people or forces for my situation, I turn instead to prayer and the Lord hears me and strengthens me and blesses and helps me. If we can say that, then we'll be motivated and strengthened for obedience to the exhortation. Verse 2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded. Now some people have taken the beginning of this exhortation to mean something like this, which is incorrect but I'll just mention it. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, that is to say, you be like Christ. Of course, that's always a valid exhortation, but that's not the meaning here. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, namely, the same love as Christ. Now, it might seem to make good sense. If there be any comfort in Christ, if there be any partnership of the Spirit and so on, well then, be like him, like-minded with him, have the same love as him. It might rather naturally read that way, but that's not the correct sense. This is a, an exhortation of how we are to behave towards one another. And so it reads like this. If there be these blessings from Christ to you, then you must be moved to be very humble and helpful towards one another. Verse 2 is about your like-mindedness with other Christian people in the church. Having the same love, that is to say equal love, to each one of them. It's an exhortation about our attitude and about our conduct among ourselves. So we look at it along those lines. Fulfill ye my joy that all the blessings you have are translated into action in this sense, that ye be like-minded. Well, first of all, the first standard or grace, like-mindedness, that you think the same way. And I'd like to explore this for a moment or so. It doesn't mean you all have the same likes and dislikes. Of course not. When we're born again, we're not made peas in a pod, all the same. We have our different personalities, our different tastes, our different attitudes, and how valuable that is. When you have a group of Christians working together and somebody proposes, let's do such and such a thing in our Christian service, and others will see the snacks or the difficulties. So we bring different perspectives, different outlooks. No, we're not all identical, but we're like-minded in various ways. First of all, very obviously, we're like-minded. Be like-minded, says the apostle, and we all put the word of God first. That is our authority for everything. If the word of God says it, that's what we agree with. That's what we obey. So... Be like-minded, that is to say, subject to the word of the living God in everything, always respecting that. Sadly, you don't find that always among Christians. And I dare say many, many of you have had this experience. You felt moved to challenge a Christian somewhere. Perhaps a Christian you know at a 
place of employment or something of that kind. And they follow some practice which clearly is not in the Bible. And you may say to that person as gently and as meekly as you can, but does not the Bible say so and so? And to your amazement, the other person says, oh, don't bother me with that. Isn't very challenged by that. Isn't interested in that. Whereas, of course, a Christian should say, what? The Bible says something? Well, then I want to examine this and test it and search it. But many Christians these days don't seem interested in the authority of the scripture. And they do much as they like in many things. Be like-minded, says the Apostle Paul. And in your church, be like-minded, subject to the word of God. That is everything to us. That's the authority of God and the supreme divine wisdom in our lives. And then, of course, holiness. Be like-minded. Holiness comes first. Shall I do this or shall I do that? What is right before the Lord? What has integrity and honesty? What honors all the standards of the word of God? In conduct, we're for holiness. And then... We take a spiritual view. As I mentioned before, things go wrong. Difficult things happen. What do we say? God has permitted this to happen in my experience and my life. I will not be furious. I will not be crushed. I will not be angry with somebody. This has been permitted to happen. I must process it spiritually and carefully. God will work all things together for the spiritual and eternal good of his children. And we believe that. And therefore we take a spiritual view, take a step back, and we take a spiritual view of everything. I must prove the Lord, honor him, seek his help. Always the spiritual view. If we're made redundant, we take a spiritual view. And we seek God's help. And we don't get ourselves into a state or a condition where we can't think and we can't function because we're so distressed. We take a spiritual view, whether small or large, the problem. And we can take knocks. And of course, we're like-minded in that we solve everything by prayer and application to God. We're like-minded, I hope, in that we're an outgoing people. And we're always concerned about the other person more than we're concerned about ourselves. We're like-minded in that we're very suspicious of material things and the world. This is the Christian way of thinking. Be like-minded, says the Apostle Paul. No, I'm not, I'm going to deny myself that. It's much too expensive. It's much too uh, uh, beautiful or precious. It's something which will, I will just... Uh, it will affect me, it will hurt me and my spiritual walk and my family. We're going to be more modest in our aims. We're suspicious of material gain and excessive things in that way. And we have a heavenly objective. Heaven is everything to us and we think of it often. So these are the words, fulfill ye my joy that moved with gratitude for the constant experience of Christ's comfort and strength and help and the work of the Spirit in your life. You are like-minded as Christian people on the great fundamentals, you think the same way. You have a Christian attitude. And then having the same love, that's in the middle of verse two, having the same love for each other, not discriminating. We are tempted constantly to discriminate. Oh, but I have my own few friends or my circle of people who are like me or I stick to the student circle or I stick to the elderly circle or I stick to my own kind. No, says the apostle, having the same love. You remember the uh, uh, situation with that... Um, performer of years and years ago, Charlie Chaplin, and he and his brother, they resented uh, the Christian faith, and they resented the church because their mother 
Well, they lived only around here, as you know, very near to the tabernacle. But their mother used to go regularly to church, but not here, I'm, I'm glad to say, but it could have been here. No, but it wasn't. And there, she became emaciated and starved. She was so poor. By the time she'd fed the boys, she didn't feed herself. And nobody noticed. The church to which she went, which was one not very far from here, that thrived in those days and had its couple of thousand people and so on. But nobody noticed this emaciated, starving woman. And of course, it had a profound effect upon her. And they always believed that because she had this long, long period in her life of years when she hardly fed herself, it led to her uh, impairment of mind. And uh, poor lady, she suffered uh, immensely on account of this. What? You can starve in a church and nobody notices? Yes, but it can happen in other ways. People can be neglected, people can be ignored, nobody notices so-and-so's problem, Mrs. so-and-so's difficulty. There are lots of people enjoying each other's fellowship and company and they never lift up their eyes and see and notice and have compassion and concern for anyone else. Now that's what's referred to here, having the same love for all Christian people. Of course, we are different, and it doesn't mean to say you have to be equally as close to everybody as you are to some, but it means, nevertheless, that you respect everybody, and you have concern for everyone. Not that people are to become busybodies and interfere unduly in others' lives. There's a tendency to do that on the part of some people, but still, we have to have notice and recognition and respect and concern and affection. We're all children of the Lord and no enemies and no hostilities, having the same love for everyone, undiscriminating love. That's the sense here. No forgotten people, no ignored people. People go absent, people disappear. It's a terrible thing if nobody notices because people are preoccupied with their own close friends or their own kind. So here's the exhortation. Be like-minded, have equal love, being of one accord, of one mind. Of one accord means together in soul. That's the literal meaning of the word. Of one accord, together in soul united in prayer, cooperating together. I mentioned it before, the working church concept of one accord, love for Christ, love for souls, of one mind, one objective, one plan. Let's look down to verse three. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Strife, the word means competition, rivalry. Don't do anything because you're in some kind of a competition to be noticed, to be superior, to be thought well of. The devil will try to get us to uh, do things with that sort of base motive. Be noticed, be special, be significant, be in charge, things along these lines. Let nothing be done through strife, competition for significance, or vain glory, literally empty conceit, vain glory, empty desire for glory. It's the same area as strife. Don't do anything out of that concern, but in lowliness of mind, and the word is very strong, I notice one uh, uh, translator tries shabbiness of mind, which isn't a good idea, but it does reflect the original quite well. Be prepared to think of yourself as a person of very low station. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. 
Dear friends, let's see our failings, see our shortcomings, lament our sins, and when we feel ourselves being tempted to think of ourselves as significant or special or better, it's time to sit down and review all the foolish things we've done and do and the things for which God has graciously forgiven us and our constant besetting sins and humble ourselves. Now, the word here is let each esteem other better than themselves. Better. The word translated better in different parts of Paul's epistles often means stronger or nobler. That is not the word that's used. We're not called to esteem, that is to say to consider, other people stronger or nobler than ourselves. It's a different better. It's a better that means higher, held higher. Better in this sense, consider other people more important than yourself. Now that's helpful because it may be that somebody quite clearly doesn't have some of your gifts, some of your capabilities, uh, isn't doing a task which is anything like as important. But you can see the lowliest person and the simplest person as more important. Nevertheless, I mean, obvious illustration, if there was a, a young prince, he's only eight or nine, and let's say we were a monarchy, not a parliamentary uh, democracy, and uh, that lad doesn't know anything yet. He's very young in the learning process. He's very small and weak, and naturally you're an adult with a lot of experience and knowledge. You wouldn't say he's better than you are, but you could say he's our future king. He's certainly more important than I am. So it's better, not in the sense of consider other people nobler and stronger and superior, but consider them of more importance than you. That's what we're called to do. That's the term that the apostle uses. Everybody's more important than I am, we say. We're talking about Christians, people who are children of God. I must behave and act as though the other person is always more important than I am. Husbands, do you know how to view your wives as more important than you are? And to make sure they have opportunities in Christian service and they get out to weeknight meetings and evening meetings also? And did you take over their role sometimes? Do you know how to do this, to consider the one who God has given you for life to be more important than yourself? Wives equally, people, Christian people, friends, working with each other, the other person is to be considered more important. It's not a preacher saying this, it's the inspired apostle, it's the word of God. In lowliness of mind, let each Esteem, deem, consider the other better than themselves. More important, as if more important than yourself. And verse 4, look not every man on his own things. That's the selfish human tendency. If we were to analyze our thoughts, considering our own course in life, our own responsibilities and duties, our own pressures, and never considering those that are upon the other person. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. It's very awkwardly expressed because the apostle goes out of his way not to allow any exceptions. He's talking to each one of us. Look not every man. This is a responsibility for every single Christian, none accepted. Oh, but you may say, you don't understand. I have an unusual illness. So I'm used to having to be especially considered and made an exception 
And so I've learned to consider myself and my illness and my needs. Doesn't matter. The apostle says everyone. No matter how important you may be, how great your responsibilities, what kind of illness you may have, everyone is to look more on the needs of the other more than on their own. Same with the young. Actually, the young are afflicted by this equally. Young people can be tempted, we all know it, we've been through it, can be tempted to focus on their prospects, their career, what they would like to do, what they are going to do, how they are going to enjoy this and enjoy that, to the exclusion of parents, brothers, sisters, who are all taken for granted. But you come to Christ, no, you've got to look upon the needs of the other and consider them. This is the Christian standard. Look not every man and woman without exception on his own things, but every one also on the things of others, expressed in such a ponderous way to get everybody in. And then these grand words in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, the apostle started with drawing attention to consolation, comfort, fellowship, the deep, deep love of Christ for his people, and having got us thinking so that we are moved at our privileges and blessings, then he gives us the exhortation, the unwanted sometimes exhortation to great humility and consideration of others more than ourselves. And then he moves to the example of Christ. So be more like him, is the argument, as you put these things into practice. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's an opportunity for us to look just a little at these wonderful words. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Who, being in the form of God. Now, to be in the form of God, of course, means that you are God. You cannot be in the form of God without being God himself, and he is. Second person of the Trinity, equal with God the Father. Then the reasoning is, consider the humility of Christ. He, was, he is God. He is eternal. He possesses all the attributes. We could turn on to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, these tremendous words, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence in the eternal world. Christ, who was in the form of God. Philippians 2, verse 6. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Christ, who in eternity with the Father was at his right hand, equal with him in every sense, in his divinity, eternity, power, majesty, and glory, who being in the form of God, and then the mysterious words, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And everybody finds that those words hard to understand. Thought it not robbery. Well, the idea is this, and this is the derivation of the Greek word translated robbery. Thought it not a matter of seizing something. You see the idea of the robber? 
thought it not a matter of grasping something like a robber may seize something and hold on to it and clutch on to it. That's the sense. Christ, who being in the form of God, very God, and with the Father, thought it not a thing to be seized hold of, to be equal with God. So Christ, how would we be redeemed? How would we be saved? Christ, God himself, would have to come and enter into a human body and a human personality and be our representative, our sin bearer, and bear himself to the eternal punishment that we deserved to bear it away and to secure our pardon and forgiveness. How would he do that? Well, by for a time, leaving his heavenly glory and the constant exercise of his power. For a time, leaving his riches and his face-to-face -face communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit. For a time, leaving his bliss and the praise of the angelic host. And he was ready to do it, who being in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be clutched at and held on to, to enjoy the full equality that he had with the Father and the Spirit and was ready to forfeit all that and to come down and to serve time in this fallen sinful world bound in the body of a man and subject to all the limitations of man's fall from God under the curse of God. And he was prepared to do that. That's the sense, who being in the form of God, thought it not a thing to be grasped, to remain permanently equal with God in the sense of uninterrupted exercise of his authority and glory. And verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. Well, the Greek says, emptied himself. Dear William Tyndale, the Bible translator, reformer and martyr, when he translated this passage, could not bear to say, emptied himself because he feared the misunderstanding that that would create. Of course, it is impossible for Christ to empty himself of his Godhead. He would never cease to be divine. He would never cease to be God. God cannot cease to be God. God cannot change. It is one of his eternal attributes. And so he modified the translation to help us, and we owe this term to him. It was adopted by the Geneva Bible and then by the King James Bible. It's the Tyndale rendering, but made himself of no reputation. That helps us. But the Greek is actually emptied himself. However, it refers to the fact that he emptied himself in the sense of stooping to having no reputation and leaving the constant exercise of his dominion and authority, proximity with the Father, total union face to face with him and bliss and glory. He never ceased to be God, even though he concealed his Godhead in a body he never ceased to be God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery a matter to be seized and clutched at, to be equal with God, but emptied himself, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. That's what he said. I am among you as he that serveth, says the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And do you remember when he washed the feet of the disciples? And then he said to the disciples, do you know what I have done unto you? Do you know what this is about? They didn't. They soon would. He had become their servant. He had become the servant of all the redeemed. He had become the one who would keep the law for us, so serving us. He had become the one who would take our punishment for sin for us, so serving us. Do you understand, he said, what I have done unto you, what it means, what it signifies? Took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He suffered temptation. He suffered hunger. He suffered thirst. He suffered exhaustion. He suffered grief. And then most of all, he suffered the eternal punishment of sin for you and for me. Being found in fashion as a man, he was still God, but his Godhead was contained and concealed and limited. Every now and then, he just allowed a little of it to show in mighty healings. Once, when they tried to take him, to execute him before the time had come for his atoning death, he just exerted a tiny bit of his divine power. It was all there inside him. And he walked through the midst of them. When the officers of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees came to arrest him and to take him, one look and they all fell to the ground. But he allowed them to get to their feet again and he allowed himself to be taken and arrested so that he could go to Calvary and die for his people. Oh, dear friends, being found in fashion as a man, subject to all the cruelties and insults, but most of all to the punishment of my sin and your sin. Well, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Be like him, says the Apostle Paul. Be like your Saviour. Be moved for all he does for you, strengthening you, helping you day by day. So humble yourself. Be more concerned for others than you ever are for yourself. And then follow Christ and be like him. And I close, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and you are exalted in him. He rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, was taken into glory. His original glory was wholly and fully restored, and in him we rise too. Children of God, one day to rise, one day to have resurrection bodies. Oh, dear friends, how much we have, how much blessing in the past, how much evidence and blessing from day to day, how much in the future. Why should it mean so much to us to be important and self-important? No, says the apostle, read the exhortations and pray for help to be that kind of a believer.